That works. All right, what's up, everybody? We are here. We are uh, with Alex Cosio of Cosio Insurance. We're going to answer some frequently asked questions about bounce house insurance. They come to me all the time, and I'm not an expert in that field, so I brought on the expert here. What's up, Alex? How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks. Thanks for having us on this uh, on this podcast with this interview. Um, you know, happy to be here. You know, any of those questions you guys get, I'm happy to address them. But uh, give you guys a little bit of background about myself. I've been in insurance pretty much my entire life. You know, growing up in the family business. Um, many of you know my dad, Larry. You know, he started in the insurance game in 1987. Um, at the time, he was actually working for uh, Allstate, um, where he was. Actually, hold on, take that back. Was it in Allstate? Yeah, it was Allstate. Take that back. It was Allstate. He was in a Sears store with an Allstate um, booth, and he was basically having all these people come up to him, and you know, they're basically asking him to insure businesses that he didn't have a market for because he worked for a captive insurance company. Uh, so he eventually got the bright idea. He was out uh, playing paintball, and so the paintball field owner asked him, hey, can you do the insurance for us? Our renewal's coming up. And that was basically the genesis for him deciding that he was going to go after all the paintball fields in America and try to write their insurance. So that was the first insurance program that we actually developed and kind of got off the ground. And then from there, it really just branched out into different amusement type of, uh, of businesses. Uh, so family entertainment centers, and then most recently the uh, party equipment rental businesses. So very, very experienced in the amusement world. Like I said, I've grown up in it my entire life. We've basically been the the test dummies and the guinea pigs for anything that we've ever gotten into. So uh, it's been a benefit, I guess, for especially the, some of the people that have seen us grow up around the industry. Um, you know, we've always just tagged along to a lot of the trade shows. So it's cool to see some of the the older people that are still doing it, especially post COVID, and then the newer people that are coming in the industry now. So uh, you know, one of the things that was the transition was in 2019. My dad sold the business to Brown and Brown Insurance. Uh, so it's a big, huge insurance agency, uh, probably the top five in the U.S. So it's a little bit different. You know, it's more of a corporate field, but um, a lot of the same people stayed on staff. Um, obviously, COVID kind of decimated us a little bit, but you know, we're making a comeback. We're making some hires and backfilling some of those positions as we try to regrow with you guys. So um, it's a little bit about us. Um, you know, we've we've done a lot of insurance and in, and in videos. Hopefully, uh, to kind of explain some of the different policies that are out there, but happy to address those as you guys have them. Yeah. All right. That's super cool. So, um, and I didn't know that, that you guys got bought by a bigger firm. So that's, yeah. that's super cool. Right. So, I mean, I got into the bounce house business, very long story short by accident. Um, you guys have been my insurer the entire time that I've had insurance. Uh, it's just kind of like, that's just the way I operate. Right. I find one that I like and I go with it, but, uh, just quick question back to kind of yours. So, so how old were you when you got into the, the family business? Um, I mean, it, literally be from day one, um, you know, we never had the option to say no to dad. So <laughs> it was like, as soon as he started up the agency, uh, even when we moved out to South Carolina, we're probably I don't know, eight, 10, you know, really starting to ramp up doing the direct mailers. So if you guys got any of those wacky postcards back in the day, more than likely that was my brother and I putting the labels and the stamps on them. Um, you know, we helped them file back when we had files and paper documents instead of everything being digital. So uh, that was kind of our starting point. But, you know, once I got into high school, I'd say probably my senior year is when I, when I finally started getting serious about insurance. Um, I want to say it was right after my senior year of high school is when I got my first license, uh, which was a property and casualty license. And then right after I graduated college is when I became a licensed life and health agent. So technically I've been licensed for a third of my life now <laughs> it's about 10 years um so it's, it's kind of crazy to think about it that way but yeah it's it's different you know you talk to a lot of people that get out of school and they're like i don't know what i want to do with my life and somehow stumble into an insurance agency somehow and you know it's kind of the opposite for me i was almost bred for it so that's amazing uh, I mean, it's a little different yeah yeah i mean that means you know you know what you're talking about so um, it helps you know especially when yeah. people call in they're like yeah i called five different insurance agents they don't even know where to go. And I'm like, Oh, you know, you have this kind of equipment and they're like, yeah, they don't have to explain it to me. <laughs> so it makes it easier. Yeah. That's super cool. So then, uh, what, and this is almost out of my own curiosity, but mm -hmm. what percent of your guys's business is of, of Cosio's business is event rental or, and, or bounce house. I'd say after COVID, uh, probably 
about 60 percent so oh, it's a wow. pretty good chunk yeah it's a it's a vast majority of what we do um you know it's a lot of small policies you know a lot of mom and pop shops that are just getting started or they don't really do it as a full-time job it's it's basically just like a weekend warrior business um so you know it's it's definitely an interesting niche not a lot of people can say that um they know where to go with an insurance market especially when it comes to an inflatable because nine times out of ten or if not ten times out of ten if you talk to anybody that has an amusement business or uh, they do any type of event rentals as soon as you add an inflatable to your to your fleet and all of a sudden now you're an amusement device rental company um, and that's usually when you get kicked out of like the traditional you know markets that you could go to for just a regular business insurance policy got it yeah because i mean when i started like we started with two back in 20 summer of 2019 we started with two units and so i did you know like being naive and not having any clue i went through my insurance agent who's you know wrote policy for the house and the car or whatever and uh he's a good insurance agent on that side but he, he clearly and we're emailing back and forth but it was clear to me he had no idea what to do where to go who to write you know and so it took like i don't i don't even remember as a long time ago but a month or two to even hear back and then it was like the policy was jacked up i don't remember how much it would cost but it was like six grand or something for two <laughs> units yeah. and i was like yeah we're gonna forgo that you know what i mean and then once I, once we scaled a little bit, you know, this is when I got in touch with you guys and it was, it was like quick and easy. That's, that's what it's all about. You know, if, if you ask me about homeowners insurance and auto insurance, I'd be a deer in the headlights. I don't know that realm at all. So, you know, we stick to what we're good at. We stay in our lane and um, we, we let the experts handle the, uh, the, the homeowners and the personal lines. <laughs> right. Yeah. So one of the things that struck me, um, right, because I'm like, you know, I make the joke that I'm like a pirate. Like I'm, I, I love to break rules. I have rules, but I break my own rules. When it comes to insurance, obviously the rules and the regulations or, or the, the procedures that are in place are there for a reason, right? To mitigate risk. So mm -hmm. when I'm going through, you know, and I got insured uh, back when I was operating off just a Facebook page, yeah. not a website, but right. I'm posting whatever pictures I want on this Facebook page. And then, um, and I don't remember the gal that I was working with back when I got my quote, but she sends me this laundry list of things that are, you know, I'm breaking or uh, I'm almost uninsurable or something like that. Uh, all these pictures I had of kids going down the slide backwards or whatever. Um, and so I think that part's very valuable because you think you just need to post on social media to get views, to get likes, you know, and then to drive business. But from an insurance standpoint, kind of, if you could give us a background on what to post, what not to post, what and why that's all important, I think that would help a lot of people. Sure. Yeah. So the, you know, like you said, people want to put content up on their on their pages, but they don't realize that it's a public space. So if if your customers can see it, so can an underwriter. And you know, if we're your insurance agents, or if you're you're working with somebody else. You know, you're not making it easy for us to sell your business as a good risk if this is what you're allowing and this is what you're advertising to the public. Uh, so we saw this a lot with knocker balls specifically. It's one thing that always comes top of mind to me was like, it's supposed to be used as bubble soccer. And yet they would post videos of people that are literally just teeing off on each other, trying to hit each other as hard as possible. And you're like, guys, this is exactly what the insurance companies don't want you to be doing. Uh, don't advertise that this is okay because if you're saying it on your Facebook page, more than likely that's how your customers are going to use it. Uh, so you know, water slides, even dry slides for that matter. You know, if you're showing pictures of a, a parent putting their kid in their in their lap to go down a slide, it's not a good thing. That causes a lot of claims. Um, usually, it's it's the adult that injures their own kid, and then they'll come back to you as the rental company and say, "Hey, my kid broke his leg in, on your slide. It must be really dangerous." You know, but it's. If you don't tell them that, hey, if the kid can't go down on their own, don't go up there, don't hold their hand, don't put them in your lap. You know, they need to be able to go up and down that slide on their own. If they can't, then, you know, sorry, here's a bounce house over here you know, or a smaller combo that's a little bit more accessible for you. But, you know, that happens a lot on like the indoor inflatable centers because their lack of supervision, that's usually what ends up happening. So if you guys are posting pictures of anything and it's showing that like there's nobody around, you know, there's there's nobody that's an adult that's watching the unit. Now, that's something that you guys also need to keep in mind is that, you know, these bounce houses or these water slides are not supposed to be babysitters. They're supposed to have an adult supervising whoever is using them. Um, you know, it's it's common, though, it's, you know, people, they, they set up at a party, 
the adults go have a great time. They say, hey, kids, go play on the bounce house. And those are usually when you have an instance uh, where there's too many kids on the unit or they're going up it at the same time. Um, you know, again, going back to the photos, don't have pictures showing that you have 10 kids on the ladder going up the ladder at the same time. Um, you know, have them showing that you have pictures that you're controlling the unit. Uh, so that way they know what it's supposed to look like. So just set a good example. Don't put anything on there of a, a slide going into a pool, for example. That, that happens a lot in Florida. I don't know what, what the deal is in Florida on that one. Uh, so, you know, take pictures, but make sure that it's a safe setup. You know, again, don't set up on like a super steep incline showing that that's a typical setup. You know, you want to be on a very flat surface. Um, you know, the, the other things around you, you know, if you guys are setting up at a like a street fair or a carnival or a school event, you know, make sure that you're showing that your your paper play signage or your rules of play are, are clearly displayed in front of the units. It's always good to have a picture of that showing, you know, before and after a setup that you guys had everything in front of the unit to show them, hey, there's a whole harmless, you know, here's the rules of how you need to be on the equipment. Um, you know, I, I can't stress that enough. You know, having pictures and documentation is so important. Just make sure that you're you're putting the right picture out there for the underwriters. Yeah, that's actually kind of leads me to my next question. So I know some of the 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 much, much larger companies, you know, doing whatever, call it a million plus in revenue, they take pictures of like basically every setup they ever do. Mm -hmm. Is that something that is um they do in-house because it's a good idea, or is that something that um ever has its own, has its roots in insurance based, you know, to help with a claim or? So I guess it's both, you know, they they wanted pictures of, of cool setups so they could put it on their websites and advertise it. But we always tell whether you're a big company or you're a small company, regardless of the event, you know, you should take pictures after you get that unit set up, take a picture. And then when you come back to pick it up, take another picture, uh, get your drivers. If you have employees, get them into that type of a habit. Uh, because if there's any type of damage to the unit, you have a timestamp picture showing what it looked like when you left and then when you came to pick it up. So you can enforce your contracts uh, so that way you can hopefully avoid having to tap into your in the marine policy if you have it. Uh, you always want to go back and enforce the contract and put that on your renters first. Um, but that also means you have to have it clearly stated in your rental contract that they are responsible for up to X amount of dollars um, in damage if your unit is, is ruined or they you know, they have silly string in it, or they put some sort of, uh, I don't know, they, they have fireworks and the fireworks fall down and burns holes in your units. I mean, this kind of stuff happens all the time around July 4th. So, right. um, you know, I, I think within some of the rental softwares, even they have a place for their drivers to take a picture and upload it. Um, you know, think about Amazon, you know, they take pictures of the package when they deliver it to you. So, you know, it's been delivered, you know, so you can have your driver send that to you and say, Hey boss, we have, this, this unit was set up correctly. All the stakes are there. You know, all the, the tie downs are, are securely attached. Um, it's on flat land. We put cones over all the stakes. I mean, it, that's about as perfect as it gets as far as the setup goes. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I started actually testing the having uh, my drivers take pictures this last weekend. And mm -hmm. it worked good from a standpoint of I knew I was protected from everything you're talking about. I mean, you have I've had times where I go pick up a unit and it's moved and the, exactly it moved it. You know, it, so it protects against that. The other thing too that was cool that's not insurance related, but I get to see all their setups, and so it creates a coaching moment for me to where I can say, "Hey, dude, you should have ran that cord this way. You don't want to create a tripping hazard, or you should have." You know, it, it creates the teaching moment. So the picture is something that I'm going to be doing going forward, and I'm actually a rather big fan of. You do that for uh, the the pickups as well, or just on the initial setup? So we did this last weekend. We did just on the setups. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't think about doing the pickups, but it does make, right? You want to check both sides of the equation. So, yep. Yep. That's something that, you know, I think just as if I was a business owner and I was doing the same thing, like I would want to make sure that I knew exactly where the damage occurred because once you roll it up and you get it back to the shop and then you're like, oh, this thing has a tear or a hole in it. You know, unless you know when it happens where you have that type of documentation, how do you know if it didn't happen at a party later on in the day versus the one earlier in the day? Right. So, you know, that's just, in my opinion, I think that's the way to go. And especially if you're going to try and hold the runner accountable for it on yep. hearsay or a whim, it's like you just don't have a lot of ground to stand on. No, exactly. All right, cool. So let's talk premiums, minimums of premiums, et cetera. Yep. So, so what is the minimum or is there a minimum? So 
It depends on what you have. It's the short answer, but I would say that in general, for general liability and accident coverage, you're probably looking at a minimum of anywhere between two grand to 3,500 bucks. So that's kind of where it's starting out. Um, the reason that's kind of changed over the years, is we're going through a hardening of the market. So it's just, all that means is that there's fewer carriers out there that want to write party equipment rentals. Uh, because if there is a claim, it's usually pretty substantial. Um, and you think about the two to three thousand dollar minimum premium. They have a claim; it's more than likely going to be like fifty to one hundred thousand dollars. Even if it doesn't pay out that amount, the expenses that go into the investigation, you got to hire attorneys, um, adjusters. I mean, all that good stuff goes into the equation, and it can very quickly rack up some serious dollar amounts. Uh, so, you know, two two thousand is on the low side, and that's if you have very low risk equipment. You know, if you guys are getting into, you know, mechanical rides, rock walls, bungee trampolines, or if you have any of those open front wedding style bouncers, um, you know, those are definitely becoming more popular, it seems, but people don't realize that it's it's more of a risk <laughs> for that type of a unit than a, a four wall fully enclosed bounce house. So a lot of the companies that we would approach in the preferred markets, they they just won't take it. They're like, no, nah, we don't we don't want that type of a unit. They felt the same way about like the, the, the jump offs, like the cliff jumps, um, some of the really, really big slides. They, they're like, you know, we don't want to have those in this. We want very like vanilla, very small operations that don't have huge mechanical rides. Uh, but, you know, there are carriers out there that will write that higher risk equipment. They're just going to charge a little bit more uh, or they may just have a higher minimum premium. So the minimum premium just means that's where it starts. You know, it's not linear. It's not tied to how many units you have. It's really just where the premium starts and then it goes up from there. So, you know, I would think that if you're a minimum premium account, you're more than likely going to stay there, at least in that same ballpark. Um, so you probably get around thirty to fifty thousand dollars a year in sales, and that's when you're going to start noticing that you're not at the minimum premium anymore. Um, you know, another thing to keep in mind is that these policies are audited, so you may pay the minimum premium at the beginning of the year, um, and it's based on your projected sales. So. You know, you think you're going to do 25,000, but then you, you get rental software, you do really well with Google ads and SEO. So you end up doing a hundred thousand your first year, you know, it, it happens. Um, but if you projected 25 and you ended up doing a hundred, they're going to audit you based on what your actual sales were. So that $75,000 worth of exposure, they're going to go back after your policy expires and say, okay, well, we didn't get paid for this. This is the amount that you now owe in addition to you having to renew your, your other policy for the new, the new upcoming policy term. So just something to keep in mind, like if you guys are having a really good year, you know, call us or let us know that you're having a great year and you want to increase your projections because you can do it midterm. You don't have to wait until the very end of the, the policy period for the audit. Um, and so for some people, you know, when you have cash flow, that's the time to do it. You don't want to wait until you know, the first of the year or the end of the year when you guys don't have a whole lot of jobs coming in. And now all of a sudden you have a big audit payment to make. Yep. Yep. So, um, I get people that ask, you know, is it worth it? Is it, should I get insurance? You know, mm -hmm. and the, the analogy that I give them is, well, it doesn't matter if you have one or if you have five or if you have 10, the same question to me is, is it worth it to get car insurance? If I'm only driving my car to work, it's like, right. Yeah. It's the same <laughs> thing where it's like, I mean, I, you guys have insured me for two years, knock on wood, nothing's ever come of it. Mm -hmm. But when it does, the two thousand and my premium is way more than two thousand now. But my first premium I paid with you guys, I think, was twenty two hundred bucks mm -hmm. a year, right? And so twenty two hundred bucks sounds like a lot, especially if you're just starting out with one, two, three units. But when, not if, when somebody falls off and breaks their femur, you're talking, like you just said, upwards of a hundred thousand. The the price difference between those two is staggering. Oh, so yeah. the, the answer is yes, you should get insurance. And the, the reason I wanted to make this video is just to kind of stress the importance of that. It's, it's the teenager that thinks they can move out because they have enough money to pay rent, but they don't factor in all the other expenses that come with it. Right. You know, you think you could just go buy two bouncers and make X insurance is one that you definitely want to cook into the cook into the overall startup plan of your, of your business. And it's, it becomes very frustrating too, from my end, because you have people that will easily spend 15, $25,000 on their inflatables or their equipment. And as soon as you say that the insurance is $2,000, like, oh, I can't afford that. Well, like, wait, you just, you just invested all this money in this equipment with what's going on. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's, 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 
and like you said, it's a necessary evil because the alternative is it's going to kill your business. You know, it's something that, you know, if you, you're not set up correctly, if you're operating as a sole proprietor, they can come after your assets. I mean, that's very, very real. You know, this idea that you, all you need is a waiver, that's, that's not true. You need to have the insurance as well. The waiver is a great deterrent. You're going to need it to get the insurance. But at the end of the day, anybody can sign a waiver and they can still sue you. And the insurance is there to provide that at the very minimum, the defense cost to get you into that courtroom if it comes to that and make sure that they defend you. Uh, to, you know, the whole thing is that the, the person who's bringing that lawsuit against you has to prove that you were negligent in some way. So having somebody who's an actual professional that's gonna defend you in that situation, it's really, really important. Yeah. But I will also say that you know ideally, you don't wanna end up in a courtroom unnecessarily. So that's one thing that uh, anything that you have, at least within our programs, we're gonna have an accident policy included where you know, if there's any type of a medical situation where, you know, two kids b bump their heads together, one of them needs to get stitches or they get their tooth knocked out or another kid lands on top of another one, they break their arm, they need to go to the ER. You know, that's not something that the bounce house rental company is negligent for. That's just purely an accident. You know, kids get hurt all the time tripping over their own two feet. Um, so if you know that, that there was an injury at a party when you go to pick up the equipment, and let's say you just ask the renters like, hey, how'd it go? Did you have a great time? You know, if they let you know that somebody was injured at the party, at that point, you can offer to pay for the medical bills with your accident policy. And it's really important to try to mitigate the exposure to a general liability claim because, again, we're going through a very hardening or very hard market trying to find carriers that will write you for liability coverage. And as soon as you have a claim, that, that market becomes even smaller. And you're talking about paying a minimum of $7,500 or $25,000 a year if you have a claim. So, you know, as much as you can do to prevent a lawsuit from being filed against you, you know, getting out in front of it, you know, say, I'm so sorry that happened. You know, please go to the doctor. If we have an accident policy. We'll take care of any of your out of pocket bills. So, if it's a, a deductible, the copay, also that percentage of the claim that's not covered by their primary health insurance, or even yet, if they don't have primary health insurance, the accident policy will step in that void and, and fill that for them. Um, so that way they don't feel like their only option is to go get an attorney. You know, they see one of these billboards on the side of the road says, you know, injured, we can get you the maximum settlement. You know, that's usually when people say, you know what, I have nothing to lose. You know, they don't have to pay anything unless you guys win the case and they get a settlement out of it. And then the lawyers are really the ones that get the most of the money. <laughs> so, you know, just avoid that altogether. You know, just offer to pay for the medical bills. It's, it's purely on a reimbursement basis. So, it's not like they just get a check and they're like, oh, here's five grand, you know, go to the doctor. They have to go to the doctor and show you the bills and the balance that's due. And that's the amount that your accident policy will pay for. And that all goes through. So I think this is super valuable. So if that happens, right, because I, I literally ask and I train my guys to ask, how did the party go every time, you know, and really you're you're fishing for an issue like that. I'm generally interested in how it went, but it's kind of a bonus that you're fishing for that. Right. And so they come to you and they say there was so-and-so got hurt, whatever. What is the process that the operator should go through? Like, do, do they call you directly? You know, kind of, how does it work? Yeah. So, I mean, if you want to get on the phone, we can, we can do it that way. Um, if you know that there's been an injury or the property has been damaged or something, take pictures, you know, get statements from the people who were there. You know, if it was the renter, if there was, if you had an employee that was there attending the unit, or if there was other people at the party that saw what happened, get written statements from everybody. Um, if it's easier to get a video, so be it. Um, you want to fill out an incident report. And so you can file as many incident reports as you want to. It's not going to do anything to your premiums. It's not putting anybody on high alert. All it's just letting us know that, hey, something happened and then maybe it could be a claim. You know, it's, it's not going to ever count against you until it actually formally becomes a claim. So, you know, get all your statements, gather all your data. Um, you need to send us a copy of the rental agreement. Uh, so showing that you had that signed contract, which has your waiver. Um, so you want to make sure that all that is included when you send it in with the incident report. Um, but in the meantime, you know, make sure that you suggest that the whoever was injured, that they go to the doctor uh, because your accident policy is not triggered unless they incur that first medical expense within 90 days of the accident. So if they wait for a year and they're like, oh, my my back hurts all of a sudden, and then they try to go to the doctor, you're not going to be able to file an accident claim. And it has to be immediate. So. The process that you're talking about where you you ask them when they go to pick it up that's perfect it's exactly what you want to do so that way you can nip it in the bud 
and let them know what the process is. Say, hey, like you just need to go within the next three months and you can go ahead and file an accident claim. Anything that you have out of pocket. So it being you know, February, most people haven't met their deductibles for their healthcare plans yet. So this is probably that time of the year when you're going to want to definitely be more proactive than say the end of the year when people might have already met their, their deductibles. So it's not really a huge medical expense for them. Um, but the accident claim form is very simple. To get an accident claim paid, it maybe takes a few weeks uh, versus being in a lawsuit and it could be years for that thing to get finally settled. Uh, so it's definitely a good way to just reimburse them, make them whole again. You know, if they get their money back for anything they had to pay out of pocket, then like, usually they're not going to have any reason to sue you for it. Right. And, you know, and, and looking at it from an entrepreneurial standpoint, I mean, that is taking care of your customer. That is yep. going to really show to them how much you care. And then word of mouth spreads like wildfire, obviously. So it's it's one step to to go to take care of your clients. So yep. I think that's, yeah. And it, that's it, another just really important piece on that, it's no fault coverage. You are not admitting guilt in any way at all for using your accident policy. That's why it's called an accident policy. It's not a liability policy, strictly accident. You know, it doesn't matter if it was an improper setup, so it was your fault, or if it was something that the participants were doing wrong and that's why they got injured. doesn't matter. It happened on my equipment. Sorry, it happened. You know, just we'll take care of it for you and make sure that you're made whole again. And like That's you said, like that, you look like a rock star to your customers when you do stuff like that yeah, versus sure. hiding behind your waiver saying, Hey, you signed a waiver. You're on your own because you're going to piss them all off. You don't want to do that. Right. Right. <laughs> so then for the incident report, where, where is that filed? How is that filed? Uh, so you can reach out to us. We can send you um, a copy of a PDF, but also if you just go into your, uh, your customer portal, if you're one of our customers, you can actually report an incident directly from your customer portal. Fantastic. That is great. That is great advice right there. All right. So let's jump to um, something that I, I kind of want clarity just for myself so I can answer questions that come to me. But how are the states different from each other? Because I know Louisiana uh, typically is either higher premiums or harder to insure mm -hmm. versus other places. And I know uh, you got some of the uh, Northeast that is like yeah. nightmare. <laughs> Yeah, so there's, I would say the trouble states, or at least the ones that are always going to be more difficult um, from my perspective, um, it's going to be Florida, Louisiana, New Jersey, and New York. Uh, those are probably the harder states to get coverage for just because the, the claims that come in, for whatever reason, there's just a higher concentration of claims in those states, uh, especially if you talk about it from a regional standpoint. And unfortunately, that region really impacts the rest of the entire state. So South Florida, for example, there's a lot of insurance fraud down there for whatever reason. Um, and I will not say in Louisiana, it's anything south of Lake Charles, I want to say. Um, for whatever reason, a higher concentration of claims from that region of the state. So, you know, yeah. unfortunately, if you're in northern Louisiana or you're in northern Florida, it doesn't matter. You're in Florida, so they're going to charge you the Florida rates. Um, same thing with New York, New Jersey, um, very litigious areas of the country. So they just say, hey, look. If we're going to play here and we're going to insure businesses here, we're going to have to charge more for it because if there is a claim, it's really going to really hurt us. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're in one of those four states, you know, you know, just know it's going to be more expensive when you when you're coming in. Yep. So more okay, expensive cool. or just less available. That's that's usually what it boils down to. Yeah. Right. OK, so then what are, what are some of the questions that you guys get uh, that I haven't touched on? Right. Because obviously you probably get them all. So anything, yeah, anything top of mind that gets asked all the time? Yeah. Um, so especially if this is geared more towards the newer people, you know, a lot of people want to know, how do I get an insurance quote if I haven't started yet? Uh, so what we need in that regard is is basically just a, if you have a Facebook page or if you have a website, something where we can see either what you purchased or what you plan to purchase within the next 12 months. That's really important. So that way we can know, hey, you know, you bought some equipment that is not commercial grade. So we can't ensure that for you. You know, don't go through the whole application process and, and bang your head against the wall when we can't insure it anyway. Um, now another thing too to consider is just the the minimum premiums. So if you are going through and you're like, I don't know, we just started the the business, we don't know what we're going to do yet. We can't get you a quote without a projection on your sales. So if you if you've never started yet and you don't know, we still have to have a number there. So uh, we we can help you with the formulas to get started. Um, you know, usually it's just going to be what your average rental price is times, you know, the, the estimated number of rentals per month, and then multiply that times the number of months that you have in your operating season. 
Um, and also just keep in mind that this is not a calendar year. So it's 12 months from the date that the policy starts. So if it's March 1st to March 1st or you know April 15th to April 15th, that's that's basically what you need to think about it. Not necessarily, okay, in 2021, we did this, or in 2022, we did this. You really need to focus on that actual 12 month policy term. That's really what we're looking for. And you know, a lot of people wanna know, okay, well, I don't know how to keep track of that, or how do I know what I've done in my sales for the audit? Get the rental software. <laughs> Um, you guys can start out with the rental software, whether it's event rental systems or inflatable office or bouncy castle network. I, I always recommend that you guys kind of start there. So that way, one, you have a website that we can actually look at. And two, you get discounts for it. And it's going to keep you a little bit more organized when you start out. Um, another thing we get a lot of is we don't have a contract or we don't have a rental agreement or uh, will you provide that to us? You know, we are not attorneys, but we will absolutely give you a sample to get you started. You know, you should always take any of these legal documents and have legal counsel approve them and finalize them for you because, you know, every state is different. Um, you don't want to take the approach of copying somebody else's uh, mistake or their problem. So just spend the couple hundred dollars, have your, your contracts and all your waivers and everything reviewed by an attorney. Um, so, but we can absolutely give you samples to get you started so that way they're not racking up a bunch of billable hours on you. Yeah. Um, other thing too that we get a lot of is like what type of units to to stay away from or is the insurance based on the number of units um, I have one but I'm thinking about getting three more is my insurance going to triple you know that's not the case it's all based on your sales so as your inventory increases or you get more units logically I think you would expect that your sales are going to increase so yes that is kind of hand in hand there but it's not necessarily on a per unit basis unless you were to buy a mechanical bull or there is a flat charge for you know, if you have a mechanical bull, it's four or five thousand dollars, no matter what. Um, you know, that's really the only other situation I could think of where they charge it on a per unit basis. But um, lastly, the other thing I guess is like the inventory list. What what do you need to have on the inventory list? And that's anything you plan to offer within the next twelve months. So if you guys are like, oh, you know, we have tables and chairs right now, but in two or three months we're waiting for our, our bounce houses or our combo units to get here from the manufacturer that we ordered at IAPA, um, you know, just go ahead and include that inventory on the list so that we, we know that you plan to have it within the next 12 months. Uh, when you're doing your projection and sales, just start the projection from when you actually plan to have the unit uh, until the end of your policy term. So everything's prorated. You know, if you add equipment throughout the year, we just need to know from that date you want it added until the end of your policy term, what are your projected sales, what's the approximate value of the equipment, and you can always add it as a prorated addition to your inventory. Um, so it's not like you're, you're locked in as soon as you sign the policy, you can't make any changes to it. There's just please, please, please always call us or just let us know when you guys are adding equipment so we can let you know if it's going to be a problem or not. Um, I don't want you guys to go out and buy a, a giant zip line or, you know, a mechanical bull from China and we can't get insurance for it. Now you have a unit that you can't run. So uh, I just don't want that to happen to you guys. That's very good information. Yeah. I mean, for, for, you know, me, I got into this business kind of, you know, the same way a lot of people do where it's like the weekend warrior side hustle thing. And then I try to scale it, whatever. And so it was very messy in the be I'm an organized person. So like my books, if you will, were, were organized in the beginning. But as it scaled and as I realized, oh, this is something I actually want to do. Then I go re retroactive and go and try and kind of piece everything together from insurance, then rental software, mm -hmm. came wages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was very hectic, um, and I started the YouTube channel to a teach people how to do it a little bit more organized, a little bit better than than I did. Um, kind of give them the blueprint, if you will. But then B to also let people know this is a real business. Right? I didn't think this was a real business when I started. I was so <laughs> naive, you know. And and yeah. as it scaled, and I started whatever googling or, or watching YouTube videos or whatever, I realized I'm like, oh my god, this is like not only is this a real business, this isn't industry mm -hmm. and now that i look at it and i can give advice to people kind of going back i kind of tell them like don't don't start this off like it's something you want to dip your toe into do it right in the beginning and it can become something special but it's a real business not just buy a bouncer and go drop it off because you rent it on facebook marketplace I, i'm pretty sure i've tried to talk many people out of starting a bounce house rental business many times just because you know, they have one that they bought, they got a good deal on it. They saw it on Craigslist. They bought one and they're like, 
I'm going to, I'm going to start this bounce house rental business. I'm like, man, do you realize you're giving up your weekends? You're giving up your holidays. These things are heavy. Like the vinyl gets hot in the summertime. It's not easy money. Like this is, this is going to be some hard work, but it can be a great business for you. And you know, you're like, man, I don't know if I want to buy more than that. And they want to know, you know, what the insurance is going to cost them. And they're like, Oh, I was only projecting $1,500 a year in sales. And you're like, your insurance premium is going to be more than that, man. You want to rethink this? And they're like, okay, you're probably right. But you know, we have a lot of people that get started and they don't realize the amount of work that goes into it. And I just, I want people to be go into the situation with eyes wide open. Um, just because you spent a lot of money on your kid's backyard birthday party and you rented one, you're like, man, these guys must be making a killing. Uh, I think a lot of the people that are in the industry for a while, they're pulling back a lot of their stuff and saying, Hey, I don't, I don't want to have more gross sales. I want to have more profit. You know, how can I be more profitable instead of just getting that top line number? I need to have the bottom line number matter just as much. Um, so just keep that in mind. You guys are building out your inventories. Um, you know, combo units, get stuff that's versatile. Don't get something that's super highly specialized. Um, you know, I guess unisex, um, you know, having the, the slides, whether they're wet or dry use, that seems to be something that's really important when you guys are just starting out to get the most bang for your buck. But um, like you were talking about organization, get the rental software, guys. I can't preach that enough. It's going to make your life so much easier than trying to do this on pen and paper. Um, you know, not only just from just getting everything into your system, but you know, when they, when you make them go through a process like that and they don't have to talk to you, they can just go online and, and book it. Why not? <laughs> you don't have people to have them call you. To you. Yeah. No. Not, people do not yeah. want to talk to you. No. I get so, that all the time. Well, I like to touch all my clients and I like to be able to help them through the booking. I'm like, dude, they don't want to talk to you. Just let it alone. They don't, they don't want to. Right. Make uh, it frictionless. Yeah. If it's, I'm, I'm pulling up my spreadsheet here. So not much changed year over year for me. Uh, my inventory is a little bigger now than it was last year in uh, this time, but mm -hmm. I was up 180% in January, basically on the back of inflatable office only. That's awesome. I mean, that's the only thing that changed. Like I said, I've got a, I've got maybe five more units than I had last year, but I mean, you know, this time last year I was around 20 ish. So it's not, not like a ton changed. So I cannot stress get rental software, right? People think of it. I did. I thought of it at an expense. I don't need to spend 120 bucks a month on this because I can do it all myself. And I got all these calendars and the shit I wrote down and <laughs> yeah, exactly. pens and whatever. As soon as I got inflatable office, you know, it was maybe a month later before you really start to see a, a uptick because mm -hmm. you start to get used to it. And so do your regular clients. And then it was off to the races. And and like I said, we were up 180% January over January. That's amazing. Just, just on the back of basically that alone. So yeah, we had a lot of people that, you know, coming into this year, especially in 2021, COVID was kind of like, oh, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, but we're seeing that at least the people that have been renewing January, February, uh, a lot of them did much better than they anticipated last year. Uh, than you know, obviously this time last year. So uh, COVID was really good to a lot of businesses because you couldn't go out to the, the fixed locations, but you could have parties at your house, you know? So people always will spend money on their kids. And it's, it's shocking to me. Uh, it's almost counterintuitive how much some of these businesses grew last year. It's, it's crazy to see, but like you said, if you, if you really invest into the software, you, you have a really good web presence because you know, everybody, Everybody shops on this these days. They're not going to necessarily get onto your computer and look for you that way, or they're definitely not getting into the yellow pages. So, you know, having good web presence, social media presence, I mean, that that's doesn't matter how long you've been in the business. I mean, you can really, really scale the business just by doing that. Um, but, you know, it's kind of cool to see the ones that grow from being very, very small. And then, you know, three, four years down the road, they've grown tremendously. And it's like, man, that's pretty cool. I remember when you first started, you didn't know what you're doing now. You got everything lined up. I don't have to ask you for extra stuff. You already know what the process is, and it's it's pretty cool to see. Yeah, I get my spreadsheets. I get my inventory stuff ready. Yep. You know, I know what I'm going to sell. I I just try to keep it all streamlined because that's the that's the other thing about insurance, right? As somebody who's not an insurance agent, as an operator, the more the sorry, the less time I can spend having to chase shit down because I already know like I already know what you guys are going to ask for. Mm -hmm. I keep it all nice and neat. I have. Right. There's an inventory sheet that was sent over to me. I think it's an Excel sheet. Yep. And I use that exact one. So I'm sending back 
the same one every time. And it just helps keep my life right. Insurance woes are like this big because I know (laughs) boom, 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 what to do. And we're off to the races. We're good to go. And which policies do you have? You just have the GL accident in the Marine or which other ones did you get? Yeah. So I've just got the general liability um, and, and everything's been working good so far as things start to scale. That's where it, I'll put it this way. I know I'm at the point now where instead of breathe a sigh of relief because I have an insurance policy, now it's something where I need to go on the back end and educate myself more so I can know exactly what to do, when to do. Because, I mean, this time last year, I literally had one guy that helped me clean units. You know, he'd come on Tuesday, him and I would clean every unit, and then I did everything else. Now it's almost flipped where I've got I've got five guys working for me now and two more that want to come on. And I still do drops and pickups, but I mean, I, you know, we, we run two trucks, so it's kind of like mm-hmm. make sure everything's on the up and up now. Cause it's not only is it a real business, but it's like a real deal business. Yep. And, and that actually brings me to something I did want to ask you mm-hmm. again, kind of selfish question, but I think it'll help a lot of people too, is how does the auto, the commercial auto work? Does it go through you? Is it attached to your same policy? Like kind of what are the details of the commercial? Yeah, so it's a it is a completely separate policy. It's not tied to any of like your general liability or your accident coverage. Um, in fact, it's an exclusion under the general liability policy. So you have to have a separate policy for it. Uh, what we always recommend is you kind of let us know what the ownership structure is for the vehicles. So if the the vehicles are owned in, in the company name, you definitely want to have a commercial auto policy because that's really what you're looking for. It's going to give you more bells and whistles than. Uh, what a hired and non-owned auto liability policy does, which is a very limited stripped down version of the auto liability. And that's basically for anybody that's using their personal vehicles or if they're allowing their employees to use their personal vehicles. Uh, the hired non-owned auto protection doesn't cover the, the physical damage to the vehicle. All, it, all you're basically covering is the business. If they see there's a bounce house in the back of the truck or they see that your, your company information is on the side of the truck, and they're like, oh, this guy's a business owner. He must be a millionaire. Let's go ahead and sue him for everything he's worth. That's usually when you want to make sure that you have that higher non auto coverage uh, because people will try to get as much as they possibly can out of that type of situation. So um, that's an exclusion again. So if you don't have higher non auto and you get into a car accident, you're using a personal vehicle or your employees are using their personal vehicle, the business is not protected for that. So uh, at least when you get sued, you're going to be paying for that out of your own pocket to defend yourself. Uh, but again, once you own those vehicles in the, the company name, get the commercial auto policy, you know, you can add the hired non-owned auto to it. And it's usually a small surcharge for it. Uh, and then you don't need to have the standalone hired anymore. You just have it added into your commercial auto policy. Yeah, because, uh, you know, mo- like I said, most of the people that are going to be watching this video are going to be newer mm-hmm. operators or interested in getting in. Mm-hmm. So they're going to have their Jeep or their Honda Pilot or their, you know, hopefully they got a pickup truck, but. It's right. going to be theirs mm-hmm. and, and their LLC is going to be this big. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. So the higher non owned auto is the way to go. You know, it's, it's not very expensive, but if you guys are looking for peace of mind, in my opinion, I think that it's way more likely that you get into a car accident than forget to set up a bounce house correctly. So, you know, something to consider is like, yeah, you guys are driving a lot, uh, you know, a lot of miles that you guys are putting on driving back and forth. You're probably going through residential areas. I mean, there's a lot of stop and go. So just keep that in mind. It is available to you. Most people, they just want the cheapest possible. Like, I just want to be able to operate in a park or a city or something. Um, but you don't think about it, you know, I guess, from a holistic, comprehensive approach of like, hey, what do I need to do to protect my business? Um, you know, talk about auto. You could talk about cyber liability insurance. You know, if you're processing credit cards, you know, I highly recommend that policy just because cyber ransomware attacks, um, social engineering where somebody's trying to spoof somebody's email address, you know, they, they're basically like, Hey, I'm a school, you know, if you wanted to put in your deposit for the spring fling, you know, you can make your deposit here. And now all of a sudden you're wiring money or sending money to somebody that's not who they say they are. And that's becoming more and more common. And with a lot of the small businesses, you guys don't have, Cybersecurity, there's probably very little training on it. You're very easy targets for these people. So um, you know, cyber coverage is maybe like $100, $200 a year. It's, it's not very expensive at all. So if you guys are looking for peace of mind, that's, a, that's an easy one to pick up. Um, outside of that, if you have employees, sexual abuse and molestation coverage, 
um, especially if you're stacking the equipment. Um, you know, all it takes is somebody to accuse you and all of a sudden you're, you're in a lawsuit um, and your general liability policy does not pay for that. So uh, something you can add into it, it's usually a percentage of whatever your general liability policy is, uh, but it could be a couple hundred dollars, could be a couple thousand, just depending on what you're paying for the GL coverage. Um, outside of that, the Inland Marine, we talked about that briefly, you know, just getting coverage on your equipment. Um, you know, if you're storing it in your house, your, your business personal property is excluded from your homeowner's insurance. I, I know that much <laughs> about personal insurance. So if you guys, even if you're storing it in your garage or if you have it in a storage building, uh, you can have an inland marine policy to cover it while it's there, while it's in transit, and also while it's set up at the event. Uh, that way you guys know that your equipment is going to be covered. Um, a lot of people ask about the inland marine policy and like a damage waiver. Does it negate it? You know, the damage waiver, that's just between you and your customer saying that if something does happen, I'm not going to hold you responsible for the fixing or the replacement of that particular unit. You know, I'm basically taking it on my own. Uh, so a lot of people will see a damage waiver as a great revenue stream, but they have to also realize that you're basically letting the customer off the hook if something happens. Uh, so if you don't have an inland marine policy, you're paying for it out of your own pocket. Uh, so something to consider. That's good. That's all great information. And, and, you know, good to know that the insurance side of this business is as robust as it needs to be and can be as you grow. So that's good stuff. Another thing too, is if you need higher limits, so depending, you know, we see this a lot in Louisiana, Florida as well. Um, really any, any player that has the, like a diocese. So if you do anything with a, a big school or a, a large organization like that, they may require you mm -hmm. to have additional policies or additional coverages, higher limits. Um, they have minimums that you have to have in order to, to do an event for them. So if you guys are getting into a, a situation where you're putting in a bid or, you know, you're like, Hey, am I covered to do this type of event? You know, they usually have a sample document where they give you what the requirements are. And if you send that to us, we could take a look at it and say, Hey, you don't have this, or you do have this, you meet this requirement um, in order to, to meet these requirements, it'll cost you X number of dollars. And again, it's a, it's a tightening market. So higher limits, if you need more than I'd say $2 million per occurrence, it's much tougher and it's going to be much more expensive than in years past. So if you're in, Let's just say, for example, New York City, you're doing any type of business in the five boroughs, they require that you have like $5 million per occurrence on their policies to do business there. So, right. so you may be looking at like thirty to $40,000 just in, in insurance. Um, so some of the bigger people, you know, that makes sense for them. But, you know, if you're a small mom and pop, you know, you don't want your insurance to be more than what your annual sales are. Yeah, that's crazy. Because uh, I didn't even know that you guys wrote policies that at the highest I've naive to this FYI, but was 2 million. I didn't even know you could write up five. Yeah. I mean, you can go, it's really about how much you want to pay for it. So, uh, you know, I had an account that was in Florida and they needed, I think 10 million or 15 million per occurrence. And I was like, Oh my God, but nice. they were, you know, they were working with Disney. So Disney has higher requirements. So right. it's to be expected. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. 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 All right. So, um, close it out here. So I've got, uh, your website, ticking at the bottom there, cosioinsurance.com. Um, that's probably best place to get with you guys. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So if you go to the website, you know, you can engage, we have a chat feature there. If you just wanted to get some basic information or some basic questions answered, um, you know, we can at least get you an estimate. If you go to the website and use those features, um, an estimate, that's not a formal quote, you know, in order to get you a formal quote, you do need to go through the application process. Um, so if you go to the website, you'll see there, I want to say it's on the, the homepage about halfway down. Um, it'll, there'll be a link there for you to go ahead and fill out the application. You'll have to register as a customer, um, full disclosure. This is probably a good time to put this out there that we have been having some issues with the application. If you started it and then you never finished it, or if you're trying to go back and complete it for some reason, there's been a little bit of a disconnect there. So if you haven't heard from us in a few weeks, definitely give us a call or shoot us a message and see if we can look and see if the application is somewhere out there in cyberspace. Um, I would, I would really appreciate that. There seems to be some common feedback that we're getting in some of these Facebook groups. So, um, if you guys are having that issue, please reach out be happy to look into it and get taken care of for you. Awesome. Thank you very much for all the amazing information, Alex. Uh, you can stay in the little studio here. I'm going to end the broadcast signing off. So thanks for uh, watching. Thanks for listening. Everybody peace out.